I wanted to start out by saying that uh, thank you to Kathy and Tom for inviting me um, here and for putting on this great symposium, which has been really exciting and interesting. Um, and then to remind you that some of the biggest challenges that face us today as a, um, as a, as a world are antibiotic resistance, emerging infectious diseases, the health of our planet, and from my perspective, these are all actually problems that involve evolution and evolution of microbial communities. But I'm not going to talk about the scary statistics that, that lead to the applied aspects of the work that I'm doing because um, that's not the focus of the Allen Foundation as I understand it. So um, they like to focus on the basic research, not the translational side. And I have to say that when um, Tom told me that, to just put aside the translational part for now and focus on the, the science, it was one of the most freeing um, experiences of my scientific career. It's really fun. So it's been a fun already um, experience to try to put the work, that, the evolutionary work um, that we're doing in that context. So uh, this may be taking it a little bit uh, for a little bit far, but I wanted to start then with the evolution of life on Earth. Um, and this is a, a tree, the simplified tree that represents the diversity of organisms that there are on the planet. And what I wanted to tell you about this tree today is to um, remind you that when we map on the geologic characters of Earth onto this tree, what we figure out is that sometime, maybe before the divergence between the bacteria and our lineage that we share with uh, the eukaryotes, um, this, uh, the last universal common ancestor evolved. So that's at the base of this tree here. And the base of this tree represents what we call the last universal common ancestor. So if we map on the geological character, characteristics of the earth and when the fossils that we found, we found, find that that division here between the bacteria and the eukaryotes and archaea happened something like 3.5 billion years ago. And that seems like a long time ago, and yet, it, if you think about it, that was only one billion years after the um, Earth began. So we think that but sometime between the first billion years, we went all the way from chemistry to fully formed biological cells. And then, since then, in the last 3.5 billion years, we've just been kind of modifying those cells, right? Descent with modification, Darwinian principles have been taking place um, and throughout the, the rest of this tree to make the diversity of life that we see. So when Woese, Carl Woese considered that uh, back in 1977, he said, well, something must have changed about the tempo and mode of evolution between that first billion years and the last 3.5 billion years. And his suggestion was that what changed was that the origin of the cell. So before the origin of the cell occurred, there was what he called communal evolution. So there was the exchange of information and maybe not even a cell, a cell type. He called it a pro progenote, where there were these macromolecular aggregates that were doing their thing and trying to contribute sort of to the evolution of life. Then what happened was the cell evolved and it created individuals and kind of stopped this communal life and in doing so slowed things down. So I kind of like this idea because it fits with what we know about population genetics, which is that when you have lots of gene flow or movement of genes, it allows selection to act um, more specifically, more rapidly, and adaptation to occur more rapidly um, uh, um, in a partic on a particular gene or particular locus. So if that happened, if the origin of the cell then um, happened um, around just before 3.5 billion years ago, that might have been what slowed down this evolutionary process by linking things together into a single individual. Okay, fast forward to today, 
and we know that um, we have million, uh, sorry, thousands of genomes that are sequenced. I have thousands of genomes from one species of bacteria that we look at in our lab. And um, we look at those genomes, and if you look at genomes across the tree of life, you basically see this structure is maintained. But what you see is that actually this um, idea of the communal mode going away isn't quite true. There's some pieces of the genome that move around and flow between organisms a lot more than other pieces. And those pieces are linked to um, viruses and other mobile genetic elements. So even though the evolution of the cell occurred and created these individuals, there's these mobile DNA elements that are creating gene flow between individuals and allowing the evolution and changing the rate of the evolutionary process. And it's that idea that we're interested in following. Now, every genome is littered with uh, viral elements, and so we're just trying to, we're just beginning to be able to discover those as we go through the genome revolution, and in, that's including your own and, and all the microbes that, that we've looked at. And characterizing those viruses is a huge new frontier um, in, in biology. But what we know about the viruses so far is that they have multiple different lifestyles. So one of them is the one they're most famous for is causing disease and hurting um, their hosts, and those are the lytic or pathogenic variants of the viruses. But there's also in the genomes these latent forms, latent forms of, of, the, of viruses and other degraded elements that encode genes that might change the traits of their host. So it's a part of the host genome now. But it used to be a virus element, right, that was able to move between genomes. And this um, has led to kind of this new idea of the way um, evolution works, which um, in, involves the core genome and the variable genome. And this is what you see when you do comparative genomics between bacteria and archaea genomes. So here's an example of Pseudomonas originosa. We looked at this genome. We compared it to a bunch of other genomes that have been sequenced, and we found islands of genes. This is not uncommon. This happens every time people compare genomes. So those islands of genes are showed here um, in red, and e each one of those is associated with what we think is a mobile element. And they're in the genome. They're heritable. The descent with modification, but the modification is these new elements that are being integrated into the genome. So we're trying to think about how that changes the way evolution happens and what that changes about predictions you might make about the way um, evolution is going to go forward, particularly as it relates to some of these big challenges that we're facing. Um, and so we're thinking about this in terms of what we call infection genomics, which we're saying is the study of how these infectious elements change the genome of their host and change their, their traits um, going forward. So um, how does the idea of infectious genomics change the evolutionary rules? Um, we've thought about this a lot, and one of the main ways that this changes the evolutionary rules is that they're not just evolutionary rules, now they're co-evolutionary rules. So it's an interaction between a cell and its chromosome and a host cell and a, a virus that's infecting it. So we've learned a lot about the host-virus interactions over the many years, but one of the biggest revolutions, the most exciting things that have been found that you've heard about already today is the uh, identification of CRISPR-Cas immunity. Now, CRISPR-Cas immunity existed long before we decided to use it for, uh, to, to use it to engineer um, genomes of all different species on Earth. Um, and the reason it's there is to protect host cells, bacterial and archaeal cells, from the infection by these infectious elements. And so, um, just so that I can remind you, there's this in the genome of a bacteria is encoded these repeat spacer arrays, and when a spacer matches a protospacer of an invading element, then it gets degraded by the cast machinery like you heard about earlier today. So this is cool because it, in, it encodes right there in the genome in a heritable way, adaptive immunity in a heritable form that is then, um, but that we can read the history of from the beginning to the end of those interactions. 
We can also predict the phenotype of a bacteria with respect to those moving genes and in infection by viruses by looking at the type of immunity that it has. So this gives us a really strong tool to try to understand the coevolutionary interactions that are happening in natural populations and makes that possible. So like other forms of adaptive immunity, like our own uh, B and T cell immunity, the uh, CRISPR adaptive immunity has memory, cross-reactivity, autoimmunity, self-recognition, and the way that viruses escape this immunity is through mutation. It's a sequence match, so if the sequence doesn't match, then the immunity doesn't work. And there's some flexibility in that that's probably built into the system in order to al allow um, the, the um, generality of recognition of viruses. So we thought about how that might change the evolutionary process, and we put together a model to try to think about um, what that would do. And our model we call distributed immunity, which is that every um, host a cell in, the po in a population that's being infected by a virus can take a new spacer, ooh, sorry, a new spacer into its genome. So you can see here, there's a genome of a, of a virus here infecting this population of cells, and each cell has gotten a new spacer at the beginning of its ar spacer array. So they all have immunity to the same virus, but in different ways. They have different genotypes with the same phenotype. And we thought in this model, we, we um, proposed that this was going to allow the host population to diversify and stabilize with respect to the virus population. Because now when the virus gets a, an escape mutation, it can only infect a subset of the population that it's in, where its protospacer has been mutated to no, no longer match the spacer. So we ran this simulation, um, through the, our model through simulations, and we found um, what happened was that when we were able to evolve distributed immunity in the host population, we saw that the host density increased, host diversity increased, and virus density decreased to the point where it actually made the viruses sometimes go extinct. So this was our model that we thought would happen, right, because the virus now has a very small infectable population because, a susceptible population, because there's very few um, individuals within the population that are going to be matched. Now, so our, now all the viruses that infect bacteria and archaea with CRISPR should be extinct, right, except for that that's not the way coevolution works. There's a, um, back and forth between viruses and hosts as you go through um, the evolutionary process, co-evolutionary process. So we decided to test this model b uh, by looking at it in natural populations, and the natural population that we work on b um, before, um, in, earlier in my lab was Sophilobus Icelandicus, which is an archaean. It's infected by many different viruses. These are the beautiful viruses that infect Krenarchaea, um, and we study this one because it's dominant in the population that we work on. And our host, Sophilobus Icelandicus, has distributed immunity against this virus. So we went in to look at how that would change the population dynamics, and we found, oh, and we looked in this single population from the Montnavsky volcano in Kamchatka, Russia, and we pulled different strains out, hundreds of strains of viruses and hosts, and we compared them to each other, found distributed immunity, and then tested in the lab whether this model would work that the virus would go extinct. And actually what happened really surprised us, and it's just an example of how we need to consider uh, the co-evolutionary context in which these things are happening. So what we found was that actually um, this emergent property of an infected cell that allows it to kill immune cells in the population. So an infected cell does not kill its host, instead it kills everybody else. We're trying to figure out why that might be, and we think it's because everybody else in the population that we were studying has distributed immunity. There's no infectable host, so you might as well kill off the other hosts that are there and promote your vertical transmission um, by, by promoting the competitive fitness of the host that you infected. So this is a surprise to us when we start thinking about viruses, because it's a mutualism where the virus is actually good for the host. It's good for the virus and it's good for the host in this immune context to kill off all the other hosts upon infection. 
So I'm sure there's many other surprises like that that are going to come out of the um, looking at the microbial world in the context of virus host interactions. And we want to we want to do that in a systematic way and try to figure out which pieces we need to understand in order to correctly model the evolution and coevolution of um, the core and variable components of microbial genomes. And we're going to start to do this in the context of the human microbiome um, and to look at coevolutionary dynamics in human island populations. And we're going to study this in cystic fibrosis patients that are chronically infected by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which has active CRISPRs and targets the viruses that are well known um, within to infect Pseudomonas. And so we're doing this in collaboration. This is what's funded by the um, Allen Foundation going forward, and we're doing it in collaboration um, with three different researchers, George O'Toole, who's a clini uh, um, clinical microbiologist who's giving us access to the human samples so we can uh, sequence populations of Pseudomonas aeruginosa as it evolves in real time with its viruses um, over time and space between humans. And we've uh, set up a collaboration with Mercedes Pascal, who's used to thinking about immunity and pathogen coevolution, and then Zoe Rapti, who's a, um, a modeler of disease ecology. And we're going to apply the models that are developed by these, um, by these modelers and others to the dynamics that we see using genomics in a high throughput way in natural populations infecting humans. And we're doing this all in the context of this new theme that we've started at the Institute for Genomic Biology, which I think really allows us to do this kind of research. This is interdisciplinary research. We're finally bringing together ecology and evolution with microbiology and medicine in a way that makes a lot of sense for understanding the evolution of infectious disease. To do this, we need the people that know about the ecology and evolutionary principles. And so we put together a team that focuses on that um, in order to uh, analyze our data with us and look at how, uh, whether we can predict this new form of evolution. And this is um, my laboratory group. It's small but growing, um, and um, we're looking forward to continuing with this work going forward.